For all those who believe I should buy a ring light, say yes in the comment section below because I know I need to buy one as soon as possible. My name is Zella Prince and welcome back to yet another reaction video that this is another simple a simple history video that I wasn't actually expecting to react to but I didn't but this did grab my attention the this video is called a stolen tank rampage 1995 now I've never actually heard of this incident so this actually caught my attention so we're gonna have to click play on this bad boy in three two one go the stolen tank rampage how do you San Diego feel California tank? U.S. 1995. Yes, I'm about to find out. The M60 Patton was an American main battle tank that had entered service within the U.S. Army in huge numbers in the 1960s. Over 15,000 had been built and had seen combat with the Israelis in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, as well as in the Persian Gulf conflict of 1991 with the Allied coalition forces. They were the primary series of tanks used by the United States during the Cold War. But by the 1990s, the it was being replaced in. in the U.S. Armed Forces by the new M1 Abrams tank and was therefore in the process of being phased out of frontline service and placed into the U.S. Army Reserve. So what was one of these 52-ton beasts doing rampaging around downtown San Diego in California on a warm summer's evening in 1995? The tank in question belonged to the National Guard and was being stored at their armory facility in central San Diego. It was an A3 variant armed with the latest version of the 105mm cannon God and a coaxial mounted 7.62mm machine gun. It also had a vastly improved fire control system, which included a laser assisted gun sight, and its armor had been upgraded so that in places it was up to a foot thick. Jeez. The stolen tank's main gun was deadly capable of firing rounds up to a staggering two and a half miles away with Jesus. pinpoint accuracy. It was also armed with a medium machine gun embedded in the turret next to the main gun that could shoot at an incredible rate of fire. But who stole the tank? So, despite the basic design being over 30 years old, it was still a deadly and highly efficient killing machine. Thankfully, no ammunition was on board this stolen tank. Oh, thank God. This was stored separately at the armory when the tanks were not in use. This particular M60 A3 Patton had been stolen by mentally troubled and disgruntled ex-U.S. Army tank driver, Sean Nelson. The 35-year-old had simply driven up to the unguarded armory, drove through its unlocked main gates, and started to roam around the facility freely. Despite there being a large number of military personnel on duty at the time, no one seemed to notice Nelson wandering around. The security at the armory was to come into much criticism as no one approached Nelson as he attempted to unsuccessfully start two of the tanks. These style of tanks did not require any kind of key or code to get them started. He simply fired up the engine by pushing on a starter button and put it into gear to get moving. Nelson then got lucky when the third tank started up. Only then was he challenged by a curious guard. But by then it was too late as Nelson simply drove off, leaving the bewildered soldier no choice but to run to the nearest guy guard post who's not wearing a military and tell them one of their tanks just steals just one of your tanks. So who was this Sean Nelson? Well, he had been born in Utah and as soon as he graduated high school, he joined the army. He only served for two years, spending most of that time as a tank driver with the U.S. Army Battalion in West Germany. It seemed Nelson was always in trouble with his commanding officers and was honorably discharged from the Army in 1980 at the age of 21. And during the 1980s, he seemed to put his trouble past behind him and for the next few years adjusted well to civilian life. He set up and ran a successful plumbing business and settled down and married a legal secretary, having a calm life for six years. His problems started to mount up as both his business and marriage started to run into trouble in the late 1980s, and he started using drugs again. In 1988, his beloved mother had died, and in 1990, Nelson's wife finally divorced him after seven years of marriage. The same year, he was in a motorcycle accident which left him with some permanent back injuries that would make it difficult for him to work as regularly as he needed or wanted to. He later filed a lawsuit against the hospital for malpractice, but he didn't win. Nelson blamed the same hospital for the death of his mother. To add to his troubles in 1992, his father, whom he was extremely close to, died unexpectedly. 
Wow. After this, Nelson increasingly turned to alcohol and drugs for comfort. By 1995, he was seriously in debt when his work van and plumbing tools were stolen, bringing his business to a grinding halt. His insurance didn't fully cover the loss, and he was now unable to work, and his old back injury was causing him a lot of pain. Then, that spring, his water and electricity were cut off because he had not paid the bills. As well, the bank had started proceedings to repossess his home, as he had not paid the mortgage in months. Nelson was now heavily addicted to crystal meth, using it in a hopeless Jesus attempt to dull Christ, all the man. physical and emotional pain he was feeling at the time. As with most addicts, it made Nelson more aggressive and at times violent. Everyone, he started to become... Why does everyone walk around when I decide to record? ...more mentally unstable and was having paranoid delusions. He even dug a 17-foot deep shaft in his backyard, wrongly convinced that there was gold down there. His girlfriend, Michelle, who had been living with him, now left Nelson, which, according to friends, made him extremely depressed and suicidal. All of this seemed to cause Nelson to have some kind of mental breakdown and pushed him to a limit that had led him, bizarrely, to steal a tank from the National Guard Armory in San Diego on May 17th. Still, how does this guy get in? Around 6.30 p.m. Without being noisy. He's not even wearing an army Soon, uniform. the local police were in hot pursuit in their patrol cars, as well as the state troopers and TV crews and helicopters. Therefore, the chase quickly ended up being broadcasted live on national TV as the tank cut through the suburb of Clamont at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour, leaving a trail of destruction as it did so. Nelson plowed through numerous road signs, lamp posts, traffic lights, and electricity poles, as well as running over several fire hydrants, causing water to shoot up high into the air. He would crush approximately 40 parked vehicles. He even managed to inadvertently cut off power to 5,000 local residents. Oncoming traffic was forced to swerve to avoid him or risk being trampled beneath the tank's tracks. And despite a large police presence, they were totally powerless to stop Nelson as the normal police tactics could not be applied in this case. Setting up roadblocks was pointless, as was trying to force the tank off the road by ramming it with a police cruiser. Deploying stinger strips was also not going to work on a tracked vehicle. The police didn't even know at this stage if the tank was armed or not, so in desperation, they considered asking for the assistance of the Marine Corps base at nearby Camp Pendleton, where a squadron of AH-1 Cobra attack helicopters were based. But apart from the legality of using U.S. military assets to attack a civilian on American soil, there was the fear that one of the Cobra's anti-tank missiles could miss its target and cause heavy loss of life among the nearby civilian population. So how did they stop the tank? Nelson completely destroyed a large RV before he turned onto the freeway and headed southbound. A short while later, he stopped briefly to ram one of the support pillars of a pedestrian bridge several times, seemingly in an unsuccessful attempt to bring it down. There, as he was once again speeding down the freeway, he suddenly attempted to cross over onto the northbound side, but got caught up in the concrete barrier of the State Route 163 that divided up the two sides of the freeway. When the tank lost one of its tracks and was unable ah, to free okay. itself, the police took the opportunity to use a bolt cutter to open the driver's hatch and ordered Nelson to surrender. But he said nothing in reply and continued to rev the tank engine, rocking it back and forth in an attempt to free the tank from the barrier. The police felt they had no option but to open fire, and a single bullet hit Nelson in the neck, putting an end to his rampage that had lasted a terrifying 23 minutes. Nelson was to die later that evening at the local hospital from his gunshot wound. So why had Nelson just wandered into a U.S. facility and stolen a U.S. Army tank? Some say it may have been politically motivated, but apart from some of his outspoken views against the U.S. government and his supposed support for the recent bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma, there was no evidence that linked him to any organization. Instead, most people, including his ex-wife and his brother, believed that Nelson had suffered a mental breakdown, fueled by his addictions. Wow. All right, I'm going to actually look into this a little bit more, because it actually caught my attention a lot more than I thought it was actually going to. Uh... <laughs> I uh, hope you guys did enjoy today's reaction video. Like, subscribe, all that stuff, guys, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.